So today, if you notice on the class webpage, a couple of things. The first one is there's no link for today. You also notice that I removed the org links for all the previous classes. Those files are still there on the web server, but the links are gone. We are switching over to Mercurial, and we'll be doing our updates through Mercurial. So we'll be asking the server to update the files for us. We don't have to do a wget. It knows where they are since we've checked them out. And the other thing to notice here is we are running out of time. There's tons of tools that can help you out in your research, and I've only shown you about this much of what I'd like to show you. There's a very small amount, and there are so many useful tools inside of what could be a research tools course that could go on for probably three years. One cool thing is that Rob Braswell, who used to be a full-time research professor here and is now an affiliate faculty in Earth Science, or in Morse Hall, and he's a part of uh, the EOS, Earth Observing and Complex Systems Group. Rob used to be the lead teacher for a data analysis course that talked about R as very similar goals to what this class was, but it's focused more on statistics. And the R open source package is something that Rob uses quite a bit. He's agreed to come in and give you guys an overview. And I took a quick peek through his class notes, and I myself would love to take his course. I don't know R at all, really. I've used R for two commands in my life. But you can actually use R from inside of Python. So there's a bridge between the two with something called RPY, and you can actually reach in and use statistical functions from R inside of Python, which is pretty neat. And R is, if you're, especially if you're a biologist, it's super powerful for all those dealing with data sets where you really have to grind through the statistics to get your answers and figure out if, if you're doing what you think. So enough of the uh, overview, let's dig into our updating and get started on things. So on the class page, I've got the notes. Uh, this is what we did last time to create the projects directory and check out, or in, in the vocabulary of Mercurial clone, the repository that has all of our class notes in it. So you only have to do that the first time. Once you've got that established, this is the command, the two commands that we'll do to go update those and we'll see that there's actually been some changes pushed in. The other thing is, before we make those changes, if I can type bit bucket here, go back into my history, you don't need to do this. So if we go to the bit bucket site for this, there's actually some nice tools here. So if we scroll down for the research tools project, you can see there's been a bunch of changes and there's a message. So the most recent change, which was I think uh, about five minutes ago, I finished the draft for class today. Those numbers here are the identifier for the revision, that particular revision of the document. They're not very friendly. They're actually, I believe, MD5 or some other checksum. So that number uniquely identifies that change. And if you click on that link, it'll actually show you those changes. So you'll see like I had somehow pasted in an old setup section. So that in red was removed, green are the additions. So you can go and see what's different. And if I make changes between now and later on, if we find mistakes in this document, you can actually see what's changed between when you took, went through this course in here and when you might be going back through it. So we'll close that. We'll go do our update. So we're going to CD in projects. In here, we've got our research tools directory. So CD research tools. And we'll just do the pull command, which is going to reach out into the place where this was cloned from and see if there's any updates. And last time we did this, there were no updates. It said no changes. This time, we expect to see quite a few changes. Ignore all the warnings that are coming from the security certificates. They didn't pay the uh, ridiculous fees that are charged for having specially signed certificates. And you'll see that it says adding change sets, adding manifest, adding files changed, added four change sets with six changes to five files. If you don't know what that means, you don't actually care. No, don't worry about it. But if we go and look in there, so we'll CD into class. And if you do an LS, uh-oh, this is where testing would help. This is weird. So this is what happens when you're new to something and you're trying to teach it. <laughs> I mostly use git, and in git, that would totally do the right thing. So let me quick try and see if I can figure it out. Class. If you're in Projects Research Tools class, 
type hg space update. And now we'll see at the very bottom there is a 23 Python binary files part 3. Oh, run Maybe update. We get a working copy. This is where I should have RTFM'd. <laughs> you guys remember my definition of RTFM. Um, let's see what happens if we say WTF RTFM. Sudo apt get install WTF. Very important program to have on your computer. <laughs> Apparently Ubuntu doesn't have, the Mac actually has WTF and it would tell you what RTFM stands for. WTF RTFM. There we go. <laughs> and that will not appear in our, in our screen capture since it's in a different system. So I won't say what it is and I won't get in trouble. So now we have our update. Now that we know that we need to run update. You can take a look at that 23. So we can do open up our Emacs. Control X2. So let's open up projects, research tools, class 23. So we're going to open that file. So projects, research tools, class 23, and Python binary files part 3.org. Here's where I would edit my notes to say hg update in addition to hg pull. So let's go ahead and start following the setup from the make dir. So we can cd clear. So I'm going to do a, the make dir dash p tilde slash class slash 23. Give ourselves a place to work. cd tilde slash class 23. Make sure we are where we are. pwd, you can see that this is the path or it's hiding right there. You can copy the org file into the local directory. You don't have, have to do that, but it's easier. So we can do a copy tilde slash projects research tools class 23 period. And what I was trying to do was basically have you have the org mode file in the same directory like we've been doing before. That way it's a little bit easier if you open up files, they'll be in the right location. So with our Emacs, that means we need to control X and K to kill our org file. So it's gone. And then open up tilde slash class slash 23 and then 23 research tools. This way, when we start opening files, like our sbet.py that we'll be working on today, it'll be in the right directory. We don't have to start managing multiple directories. I can't remember, does it keep a copy of it in the original location or completely? If you do CP, it'll copy it over and there'll be two copies. If you do an MV, it's going to be disappearing from the original place. So here we are back at the same file. We're going to scroll down to the setup. So we've done our CP. Now you guys are going to run the curl command just like before. Remember you need to do an edit copy because meta w only copies with inside of Emacs. So copy those two lines and then edit paste over here. And it's going to run the curl command to go grab the data file, the same one we've been using the last two classes. And then v unzip to and your sample.sbet.bz2. And if you want, you can do your MD5 sum again to be extra careful. And thankfully, things are the same. So now let's start IPython again and get back into Python. IPython. And we're going to try and power through today and see if we can plot out our ship track because we're getting close. So I'm going to do the log start again so that we don't lose in case we have more power outages since we're on the wrong side of the train tracks. So log start dash o dash r log class 23.py. Press enter. So we've done our log start. If we do an ls, you'll see there's a log class 23. And now we can import struct import numpy or nump as some people say, import math. And we can load up our data just to make sure we have it around to work with. So sbet underscore file equals open sample dot sbet and we'll read the data so we have it around data sbet file dot read and whose the nice thing about actually doing this is at least we've verified that we can read that data file and it came in <coughs> since we'll be using it a ton today and last time we did some tweaking to our emacs to make it 
uh, highlight parentheses. So if you see here with my cursor on semantic, it's highlighted both sides. So let's make sure those are turned on for your, your Emacs session. So under Tools, turn on Source Code Parsers Semantic. And this is going to help us be able to jump to functions faster in our code. So make sure you hit that one. So Source Code Parsers under Tools. And the other one is Options Paren Match Highlighting under. So Options Paren Match Highlighting. So Tools. So that now has a checkbox next to it. So the two things were Options Paren Matching Highlight, which is the second one down. Make sure that's checked. And Tools, it's about six down, Source Code, Parsers, Semantic. If you don't have these options set, it's OK. You just won't have the little fancy highlighting of parentheses going on. Now, if you want to make sure to save this, and I don't think it saves both of them, but it at least saves one of them, under Options down at the bottom, there's Save Options. So if you fiddle with things and you want to keep them around for your next time, you have to go down to Save. So let's catch up to last time. And rather than typing it all in again, because I think you guys have done enough typing, let's copy this section. So control space at the first pound in the pound bang. So we'll scroll down here to the end of the source block. It's getting long. So I'm right here, right at the beginning of the pound plus for the end source. And I'm going to do a meta W or escape W. Now I'll do a control X2 to split the buffer. Control X, Control F to find a file. And we'll type sbet.py to open up our sbet par parser. And do Control Y to paste. And then we'll save that. So Control X, Control S. And let's just test it real quick with a run sbet and see what happens. And so it should say starting to run script, reading 22,000 bytes and then a whole bunch of parameters from the very first datagram. You can open up another terminal. So CD into Projects Research Tools. Press Enter. HG Pull. HG Update. Uh -huh. One file's updated. Okay. So now CD into your class and then 23. So CD tilde slash. You should say tilde slash class slash 23. Press Enter. Now what you can do is do the CP. Rerun it. So cp tilde slash projects tab. Yeah, and then do a slash and then an r and then tab and then class slash. Yep, and then 23 and then tab and then period. Enter and now go into your Emacs and open up that particular one. So now we've run it. We've seen that we've got that file again and we're ready to start adding code to let us read the whole SBET file. If we go up to, if we click in the top window, so we're now in the sbet.py file, go up to IM Python, hit rescan, and now hopefully you'll see under functions, there's decode and main. We'll be adding some more functions down the road in the class. But we want to go edit decode so that it can handle reading any particular packet we'd like in the file. So click on decode, and it should take you right to the beginning of the decode function. If not, you can also do a control S and search for decode and keep hitting control S until it loops around and gets you back to the right spot. And the first thing we want to do is be able to tell it that we want to jump to a particular offset in the file. So if we say def decode data comma offset and we'll do a default again to the, be the first packet. So if you just said decode, pass it some data, it'll read you the first packet or datagram out of the file. And then if we look at our unpack, we want to be able to go anywhere in that data file and grab a particular datagram. What we'll do is we'll take that offset and we'll add it on to the beginning and the end spots of our data, so our square brackets for addressing it. So we'll say offset plus zero. Now, it's a little weird to say offset plus zero, but sometimes it's good to be a little bit explicit. You could leave off the plus zero and it would still work. And then colon and then offset plus eight times 17. So what this is going to do is we're going to say offset and we're going to point it somewhere else in the file. And this actually shouldn't be 17. This should be eight times 17. 
and this is going to be so one times and one times or this will be two eight times 17 will be right here so this will be the third one so what we can do is by changing this number we can point into the file at various offsets and say we want to start reading here or here or here or somewhere on down through the file so in the notes here's the the line that you'll be doing and now we also need to create some helper functions and the idea with programming is that rather than jamming everything together into one giant function or one big file you want to try to break them into logical things that you're going to reuse so we have a lot of tasks that we're going to want to to have done for us a lot of times. Mm -hmm. And one of those tasks is we want to know the datagram size. And if you keep having to specify 8 times 17, or if you knew that that actually was 136, if you wrote 136 everywhere in your file, you're trying to remember too much and you're doing a lot of work. So we're going to create a variable called datagram size. It's going to save how big each one of these chunks is. So this section right in here is 136 bytes long. So we'll put that in our file. And I, I'm going to put it right above. So do meta w, control x, o. And I'm going to put it right under field names. And we also would like to have a function that can tell us how many datagrams we have in the file. So if we know a file length, so if we know how long it is here, and we know that each one of these is 136 bytes long, we could take the length of our file, divide it by 136, and that should tell us the number of datagrams that are in that file, assuming the file isn't screwed up somehow. So let's create a little function that'll do that for us. So I'm going to type through it slowly. So def num, so num is just short for number, datagrams, data. Now I'm going to have a documentation string between two single quotes. How many packets are in data? I'm going to leave out the comments for now. And the first thing I'm going to do is assert something. So assert, what assert does is if you put an expression in there, it resolves to true or false. Let's try it out. If you say assert 0 equals 0, it, it's OK. But let's assert that 1 equals 0. So that 1 and 0 are the same thing. It doesn't think that's true. And so it throws an error saying, I really don't think with that 1 equals 0. So I'm going to give up and quit. So what you can do inside of your code is when you know something should be true, but it's always possible that something could be broken, and you'd like to check it before you go on because things would be really bad and confusing if you didn't check it first. And if it's messed up, like the file's the wrong length, if something is truncated or there's junk in the file, you'd like to know right away rather than getting partway through your code somewhere else and discovering that something's not working and you can't figure out that the file's the wrong length and probably not an SBET. A simple example of assert that might be a little bit easier is you can say assert true and nothing happens, it keeps going. If you say assert false, it blows up and says uh, something's wrong, I quit. So we can add assert len of data, so the length of our data. There's a section here that says percent or mod, M-O-D. So the percent symbol, you probably don't know what mod stands for either, since that's sort of weird vocabulary. But what that is is if you divide something, so if we say 21 divided by 4 is 5, that's the, the number of 4s that are in 21. But if we say percent, that's the remainder when you do integer division. So the mod character is actually really helpful sometimes. It can do some really powerful tricks. So let's see some examples. So if we say 0 mod 2, we'll get back nothing because zero, the remainder of 0 divided by 2 is 0. If we have 1 divided by 2, we have a remainder of 1, and we get 1. 2 divided by 2 is going to be evenly div divided, so no remainder. Press Enter, there's no remainder. And 3 mod 2 gives us 1. So what do you think is going to happen if we have 100 mod 5? 0, right on. Now, what's going to be 104 mod 5? 4. So what this does is tell you 
If you know the packet size that's going to be the same all the way throughout this file, if you divide the packet size into the file length and you get any remainder, something's really wrong. You're getting a partial packet somewhere in there, or the file isn't even an SBET. So this assert in our code, assert length of data, mod datagram size, so what's the remainder? We're going to assert that that's equal to zero with double equals. And as long as there's no remainder, that's true, and the code will keep running. So if we pass a bad file, this is going to possibly detect that if it's the wrong length. And our function actually is pretty simple. We want to know how many datagrams there are, so we return the length of data divided by the datagram size. So that'll be 136, as defined right up above. So save that. Control X, Control S. And let's go ahead and give that a try. So first, I don't believe we've loaded SBET. So if we say import, I think we need to say import SBET first for the first time. And from now on, we can do reload. So I'll just be safe and do reload SBET. Now we can test it with our data. So we can say length SBET data. We get back 22,712. Let's try dividing that by 136. Let's do it ourselves. We get that there's 167 packets. Now let's try 22712, so our total length, mod, and then our packet length, which is 136 bytes. So we get zero, so there should be okay. So let's go ahead and try from SBET our num datagrams. So SBET num underscore data datagrams and we'll pass it our SBET data. And we should get back 167 datagrams in our file. And lo and behold, it worked. If you have an indentation error on line 21, that means you should scroll until your L24 becomes L21. Yeah. Press tab, and that'll re-indent that. And if you notice oh, it bumped it back bad. one, scroll down two more to the return, and press tab again, and it will re-indent oh. that line. And then you can save it with Control X, Control S, and then give it to the go. Yep. Can you change the datagram size, or there is a specific The datagram size is specific to SBET. So with an SBET file, every single datagram is the same size. We can't change that. It's fixed by the people who design, designed the SBET format. So we're stuck with 136 bytes per datagram. Uh, there are other formats with all sorts of other sizes and shapes and strangeness. So now we have a function that if we ever want to know how many datagrams are in a file, you can just ask it and it will tell you. Just a warning, for the rest of the code today, I'm not writing for speed. So the code I'm writing will be kind of slow. So if you actually start doing SBET processing and you want to use a 800 megabyte file, you'll want to talk to me or Glenn or someone who's done this before and written code to go fast because this code will run really slow on big files. But at least it will show you the basics of how to do it. OK, so the other thing we'd like to do is for each datagram, if we want to look at some, like say, datagram number 50, we want to know how far into the file it is. And that's actually fairly easy to figure out. You take the datagram number, and you multiply it by the datagram size. And that should give you the number of where we are. So if we have 136 is our datagram size, and we multiply that by 50, the 50th datagram is at location 6,800. Now we could just do that anywhere in the code that we needed it, but that's not very nice. So let's create a function that will capture that process of getting the offset. So right below your def num datagrams, let's add a function called def get underscore offset. And we'll pass it the datagram number and then a colon. And now we'll have a documentation string. You can skip this if you want. Calculate the starting offset of a datagram. First, datagram is number zero. So I'm counting from zero here. The first datagram is not number one. It'll be number zero. And we'll say return datagram underscore number times datagram underscore size. Now these functions aren't very big or exciting, but this way, you, when you read the code, 
you understand what the person is trying to do, get the offset or ask how many datagrams there are, rather than see some number times 136 or some number divided by 136. And hopefully it will make your code a lot more understandable. So let's try it. So we'll say reload sbet. And now we'll try doing some offsets. So sbet.get underscore and then tab offset. These are things that down the road you'll want to put in what's called unit tests. So you'll want to capture these things because you know the answer. And if your code ever stops producing the right answer, then it's probably broken. And there's nothing like, say, a cat walking across your keyboard when you're coding, and then you try to undo what's in there. Um, unfortunately, real stories. So what you do with those things is you build up what's called a unit test. And we won't make it to unit tests in this class, but they're, they're very important for scientific data processing. We knew that the first one was supposed to be at position 0. And in fact, it's at position 0 according to our code. We do an offset of 1. What should it return to us? 136, exactly. And if we try sbet.get offset 125, this is where I wouldn't know off the top of my head what the number would be. It's at 17,000. Or we can do the 50 that we did before. So let's just do that too. So 50 should be at 6,800, and it is. So now we have some helper functions that are going to make our life a lot easier when writing code for the rest of it. And we're going to go modify our main to start being a lot more useful. So if you click in your sbet.py file, and you go up to your im-python, scroll down to functions, you'll see there's now two extra functions, numDatagrams and getOffset. But we want to select main and go down to the main function. This way, it's kind of nice to be able to sort of see what's in your file and not have to keep remembering, is the main down below or up top or somewhere in the middle? Click on that, it'll take you to your main, and we can start modifying it. If you start in your main file with the print read this many bytes, we're going to delete everything in the main from there on down through the finish. So I'm going to highlight that region from print to print. Press Control W to cut it. So now our main only has three lines with a print and the read of the data. So there's a, a comment here that says new code starts here in the notes. That's where we'll start. So we'll start off by saying print. And rather than the, the file length, that isn't terribly interesting, we can say print number of datagrams, colon, inside of a string, comma. And then we can use our function to calculate the number of datagrams. So num underscore datagrams. And then we'll pass it our sbet underscore data. What we'll want to do now is we're going to want to walk through that data file. And for each packet, we know how many packets there are. We're going to count the number of packets and ask for the location of each one. And we're going to go parse that data using our decode. So we'll first start off by creating a little header that's going to what we'll print out. So print and then a string of datagram number, comma, time, comma, x, comma, y. This is just going to give us a little extra information. And now we're going to go through a for loop that's going to loop over all the number of datagrams. So for datagram index, that's going to be the variable that contains the number of our datagram. In range, so range is going to return us a sequence of numbers between 0 and the highest number we give it, but not including that highest number. And what we want to pass it is the number of datagrams. So we're going to count from 0 through, uh, I think it was 126 datagrams. So we, we don't want to type in that number. We want it to ask it. So num datagrams sbet underscore data. So that should return 126, a colon to end the definition of the for loop. And inside, we want to find out what the offset's going to be. So offset equals get offset datagram index. So first time through, that's going to be 0. And we'll get the offset of 0, which is 0. Second time through, it's going to be 1. Get offset will return 136. So then what we need to do is use our decode with that offset to go into that blocks of data and grab the right one and return us a dictionary. So we'll say datagram equals decode. 
And then we're going to pass it first, the data, so fbet underscore data, comma, and then that offset that we just calculated, offset. Now, we could print the whole dictionary, but that's getting kind of annoying. So we'll say print, and we'll use the datagram index that we're, that's a part of our for loop. So it'll say which number we're on. And then let's go grab the time, the longitude in degrees, and the latitude in degrees. So we'll say datagram underscore index comma datagram. So that's our dictionary that came back. And the first one was time. So remember, this is our definition of what's where. So we're going to grab that time, the datagram, LON underscore degree, and then datagram latitude underscore degree. Let's go ahead and save that, and we'll see how well I typed. We'll see if we have any bugs. So let's run that. So reload sbet. Now here, I've just done a run to make life easier since we've modified our main. So we can just say run sbet. And hopefully, what's going to happen is a whole lot of stuff is going to go streaming across your screen. And it's 100 and should be 126 lines plus a little header. So I'm going to hit Enter, and it's going to go zooming by. And look there, we've got lots of data. So what you have now is a nice little table of where this ship was when it collected this particular data set. Here we did our run, and now we have our results and we have 167 of them. That's great. Unfortunately, it's, it's printed out to the screen and we can't really use that result anywhere. So we need to improve our code. And what we'd like to do is be able to have something that loops ac across this and every time through it returns back the next datagram. In Python, they have something called generators. And this is gonna feel a lot like magic. It's kind of strange, but if you get used to generators and you have lots of data formats, creating a generator for each one means you can write a for something or other in some file, and every time through that for loop, it's going to return you the next item from that file. It's really, really powerful and really, really compact, so it's only a couple lines of code. If you don't totally understand it right now, just try to absorb it, and when you get to writing one of your own, Go back and read the Python documentation and some tutorials on generators, and maybe come back and look at this. If you need more help than that, ask away, and I'll try and give you a better description of generators. Let's convert that into a generator inside of our code. So I'm going to go just above main, and I'm going to create a function that basically it's going to load our file and give us back one SBET datagram at a time. So def create our function name, so load underscore sbet underscore file, and then we'll pass it a file name, then a colon, give it a documentation string, so this is a, and I wrote generator in all caps so that you would recognize the word, since that's what you would search on in the documentation. We can loop over with a four, and we'll do the same thing we did before with opening a file, Instead of opening a specific file like we did here, we're going to open up file name. So we'll say sbet file equals open file name. So we'll, we'll be passing that in. sbet data equals sbet underscore file dot read. So that's very similar to what we did before. And now we're going to loop across all of those and we're going to use a special function <laughs> called yield. And yield is what's going to return back our next datagram. And we'll type this all in, and then we'll go try out some of this to see what it's like. So for datagram underscore index in range num underscore datagrams, sbet underscore data. So that's going to return our 167 things. We'll do our offset equals get underscore offset datagram underscore index. So that's going to return zero for the first one. 136 for the second one, and so on. Datagram equals decode sbet data, comma, offset. Now, if you're having trouble keeping up with the typing, or if you're having typing accuracy troubles, you can also just paste in this section to catch up and go back through it later. I'm also wanting to add in the index number. So before we kept track of it, I'd like the datagram 
dictionary to also have this index number, so we need to add it to our dictionary. So that's what this next thing is going to be. So we'll say data gram left square bracket single quote index right single quote right square bracket equals data gram index. That way we know which data gram we're on. And then this is the magical generator thing where we say yield data gram. So we'll save that. We now have this magical function that will loop through our file and return back to us one dictionary that contains an SBET packet or datagram. So let's try this by hand before we put it in a, in a for loop so you can see what's going on a little bit. It's still a little hard to understand this way, but at least you'll have a sense of that it's creating some special objects. So what we'll do is we'll do a reload of SBET to grab our new code. And now we can say sample equals sbet.load underscore sbet underscore file. And now we have to pass it a file name because we have a generic function that doesn't know which file it's being opened. So sample.sbet. If we say type sample, it says I've got a generator. So it's a lot different than you're used to seeing. Usually it's been, it returns us an actual dictionary. These generators, they're kind of new in Python and not that many people are familiar with them, but it really is a wonderful tool if you can get comfortable with it. So if we say print sample, it shows us that it's a generator object and then it says it's a load SBET file and then this horrible pointer number. So it tells you a little bit about where it came from, but let's let's try and use it. So, is it picking up that it's a generator in the type because it is a function that has a yield in it? Combination of the four yield make it a generator. The yield in there triggered this weird generator creation. I don't know how Python does it. It kind of baffles me in some ways. I haven't looked into how they magically do that. But if you put a yield inside of a function, rather than being a normal function, it turns into this generator thing. So what we can do now is say sample period and then tab and that's the completion that shows us what's in there. I have to admit I don't know what a lot of these things do but there's a key one in here, next. That next function call is what's going to get us back a datagram. So call sample.next, two parentheses, press enter. We actually get back a datagram. So that's kind of cool. Is it not very helpful because we didn't save it to a variable that we can do anything with? So we can say data gram equals sample dot next. And there's kind of a fun cheat that I haven't shown you in IPython. If you type P, you don't have to type out the word print because I think the authors of IPython thought the less typing the better. So P is print and then datagram. And we have our dictionary that contains one datagram. And if we look somewhere in here, should be a datagram index. Second one all the way to the right. So our index is one. Now if we do another datagram and we print it out, so our second one, our index is now two. So if we keep asking it for another next, 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 we'll be able to walk through the whole data set. So you can keep calling sample.next and sample.next, sample.next. If you notice the velocities here, the angular stuff, if you watch those, they keep changing. So that if you watch that number the next time through, it's a little bit different. So we're grabbing each of the different packets back from the file. Now, if you have to go write this for some other data format, I expect it to take you a little while to wrap your head around this, but you at least have seen one case of it. So let's try and do it in a for loop. So we can say for sample in sbet.load sbet file and then give it the sample.sbet name of the file, colon. So we're going to do a for loop. We're going to walk over every single datagram in this file. And thankfully, this is a sample data file that's small. Press enter. And now let's just print out the sample that comes through each time in our for loop. So it's going to return. Every time it goes through a for loop, it's going to give us back a sample with a new datagram in it. Press enter three times. That's what you would type and it's going to fill your screen full of all the datagrams in a very not useful way. So let's do it in a nicer way. 
So let's replace our print of just sample with sample square brackets and we'll pull out the longitude underscore degrees comma sample square brackets lat degrees. So let's try that command. Press enter three times and you should hopefully see something that looks a lot nicer where you actually get the longitude and the latitude printing out in two columns all the way down. So I'm going to hit enter, enter, and enter. And now we have our cruise track. And something that's looking like we might actually be able to plot this pretty soon with matplotlib. It would be much better if we save this to a variable so we could do something with it because I don't know about you, but I'm not going to get out some graph paper and plot out those dots on a map somewhere or get a chart and then go looking for those numbers. That's just no fun. So we'll say data equals, and let's create an empty list. And we're going to go loop through it and we're going to add stuff to this loop each time so we have a data that we can work with. We've created our blank list. We'll say for sample in, you know what? I'm going to go up and edit the old one because I don't like typing so much. So this line is the same, the first one, and the print line, I'm going to control K to kill that. So just like Emacs, control K kills from where your cursor is to the very end. We'll say data.append, and then a left parenthesis and a right parenthesis. Inside of that append, we're going to pass a little list. So two square brackets. So inside of this, we're going to pass it first the sample longitude, not log, but long degrees, and our sample lat degrees. So when you've got that, go ahead and hit enter, and hopefully this actually works. Anyone have it go? Nothing yep, nothing. <laughs> So instead of printing it out, we've actually saved it in the variable so we don't have to face down tons of data. Remember the whose command? We can say whose and list, and it's only going to return to us the list type variables. And we only have one of those, which is our data. It's kind of nice. And you can see that we have entries with coordinates, and it's shortened it up so it's a little hard to see. So we can say data 0, get back our first one. We have an x and a y. We want to see the last one, data square brackets minus one. If this ship was driving a straight line, this would be our bounding box. But if we can make it to the plot, you'll see this ship was definitely not driving a straight line. That's okay, but it might be better to have a dictionary or something like that. But why don't we create a new data, which we're going to rebuild data so that it's actually dictionaries and each one of those entries so we've got all the values and we can come back through them. So we'll create a new one, data equals left square bracket, right square bracket. So we're going to wipe out data. So if we do whose list, we have an empty list for data. And we'll say for sample, ah, I, don't, I hate typing all this stuff. All right, data append, I'm going to just Go to that first square bracket, hit control K, we'll nuke everything to the end. And we'll just type sample. So we just want a list that's got a dictionary for every one of our datagrams. If you were doing an 800 megabyte file, your machine would basically lock up at this point. But for this time, it's not too bad. So hit enter three times. You're done, type whose list. And you can now see there's curly braces in here with a name. So we can go and get things by name. So we can say data, grab the first one. And then we can say lawn underscore degree. And we get back our degrees. So what we want to do now is we can build a list of all of our x's and a list of all of our y's. And then we can plot them. So let's create a list of our x's. So x underscore list. And I'm giving it not just the name x because we're going to want to create an array, a numpy array later on. And to distinguish the two, I'm going to make an x list as just sort of a temporary list, and then we'll turn it into an array. So we'll say that is an empty list with two square brackets. 
And now we can say for sample in data. And we can say x list append. And in there, we're going to pass it sample long degrees. So what we'll do is we'll build a list of just the x's. Press enter, and enter, and enter. Let's run our who's again, just so we can see it. And now we have a list that's just our x's. And for speed, let's turn it into an array. So I think we've already done import numpy before, but I'll just follow the notes. And we'll say x equals numpy.array. And we'll pass it our list, x underscore list. So now if we do p search, which you haven't seen before, this is a search on variables. It's kind of like who's, but it's searching on the variable name. And if I remember right, it should return all of our variables that are named x. So we have an x, an x list, and we have a function called x range, which snuck in there. Let's just type who's, hit enter, and we'll find x in here. I knew, I was pretty sure it wasn't an array, and so I couldn't remember that it was an nd array, so we have who's nd array. And we'll see that it's 167 elements, and it's a type float. And let's go ahead and plot it. So we need matplotlib from matplotlib import pi plot. Let's turn on our interactive mode so we don't have to fiddle too much. Pi plot interactive true. And let's plot it. Pi plot plot x. So this is going to start seeing our cruise track for our ship. And there we go. This is a ship. This is the x axis of where they were in terms of longitude, so their east-west location. And they went out, and then they kind of came back a little bit, and out, and back, and out, and back, and then, yeah. A little confusing just in one dimension. But let's go ahead and try and do the same exact thing we did with x with y. So I'm going to scroll up to my, through my list here. And the first thing we wanted to do was create an x underscore list. We'll change that to y underscore list. That's good. And we'll go back up and grab our for loop. And we'll edit it. So before, we did for sample and data. And then we had x list. So we're going to change that to y list. And we had sample. And then we accessed LON underscore degree, and we want to instead access the latitude or LAT, which is our Y. Press enter twice or three times. Now we want to convert that. So if we type uh, whose list, we'll see that we now have a Y list right there. Let's convert that to an array. So we'll say Y equals numpy, and then we'll say array. I hit tab at a very bad time to make it kind of messy. Y list, press enter. And now if we type who's nd array, we now have our x and a y arrays that we can plot. Now we already have something in here. And if we try to plot the y at the same time, I'll just show you it does bad things. So pi plot plot y. Again, we get two plots that are not really related. so. We have our x and y at very different locations, and our plot's terrible. And in the notes, there's a nice solution for that right here. It's pyplot.cla, which will clear our graph. So pyplot.cla, parentheses, that clears our graph. So now there's nothing in there. And let's just plot our y, see what that takes look like before we jump into anything else. And the y, again, has the same weird look. Really still not very helpful to understand what the ship was doing. So let's run another CLA. We'll get rid of that. So it's gone. We can now say pi plot plot x comma y. So this is going to plot it in sort of a map view look. And this NOAA ship, this is their cruise track for this aspect file. So this is not mowing the lawn. They're doing something different. So unfortunately, we didn't pick a normal survey, which would be nice to sort of see typical mowing the lawn that comes with hydrographic surveying. 
but it's still pretty interesting. So we now know what the ship was doing in terms of their location. And we're now digging into the, the data and we're actually able to read into this binary SBET that at first looked like binary goo. Once you get good at this and if the format's well described, you can often in a couple hours write a parser for that data and start working with what's inside of it. So I'm gonna end right here. We'll pick up on the next class with trying to build a KML of this um, SBET file and then we'll move on to the last few topics in the last couple classes and binary files. If you haven't done it before, it definitely can be confusing. So if you didn't get it all, go back through it and ask some questions and just expect it to take some time before you understand fully. It's a lot of stuff coming at you really quick.